We're out here at Hyperfest at VIR, and as always, I'm trying to look for the most interesting cars to feature. Uh, this is probably one of the craziest Miatas I've ever seen. How much power does this thing have? So the, the car on the dyno laid down 800. We have an in-house dyno at the shop. Uh, the car at the dyno laid down roughly 800 at the tire, but that's with about a 15% slip. We were seeing the car register 8,800 on the dyno, even though the actual engine RPM was 10,300. So uh, you have to figure in about a 10 to 15% loss in actual reported uh, wheel horsepower versus what the dyno measured. So you're saying eight to nine times the power of the original Miata. Oh yeah, 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 for sure. That is insane. It's, it's pretty You're wild. insane. No, no, it's, once you drive it once, you could strap in if you want. Once you drive it once, you'll understand. It's insane. I don't, I'm too scared. I don't think I want to drive this thing. The, the only thing that's not forgiving is the wheelbase. Right, it's so, the, the wheelbase is a Miata wheelbase. And yeah. this is, this is uh, what they race, obviously, in spec Miata MX-5, yes. right, with, 100 horsepower, basically. Yep. And then you're, this is insane, this is crazy, look at this. So then, what was your idea? Like, what was the concept behind so building it, this? It's pretty funny, one of my employees is sitting in the truck right now. When he signed on, he was military, he's a, uh, he was a military Chinook pilot, or a mechanic. And uh, as he was getting out of the military, he became a customer, and then he's like, hey, dude, you should start to do track days again. And I hadn't been since 2008, so he became an employee in about 2018, 2019, kind of at the precipice of uh, COVID. And I was like, sure, yeah, why not? So we went to the track day, this was nothing like this. It was still the original engine, turbocharged, making 280 horsepower. And then I kept pushing that platform, and as I pushed that, we were starting to blow up motors as we got to 585. So we got to 585 horsepower, we were blowing up transmissions, differentials, and motors. And we weren't blowing up motors because the power was too much. We had an oiling issue because we were seeing 1.3G in the middle of the turns. So then we went to dry sump on the BP. The BP platform eventually started to crack main caps because we were making 585 and I think 500 foot-pounds of torque. After that, after the multiple head gaskets and the blown transmissions, we swapped to a BMW ZF trans. That alleviated a lot of the issues, but the slop in the transmission was, it, it left you wanting. Eventually, we decided to pull the trigger last year on the K-Series. So we went to Grid Life last year in Car at Carolina Motorsports Park, and the BP lifted the head. 30 days later, we were at Road Atlanta with fully fabricated components, new K-Series, sequential transmission, Cadillac CTSV rear end, built the wiring harness in 30 days. A, a lot of it was done in a hurry. We had problems with that setup because of how quickly we did it. That old cylinder head that we got from a customer was deforming anytime we hit boost. So I didn't touch it for about nine months, and this is our newest iteration. It is a K24 bottom end. Uh, it's a de-stroked 2.2 crank, and that 2.2 crankshaft has uh, custom BC rods with the BC crank. We one-off ordered a set of CP pistons. It's a four-piston as-cast kingpin cylinder head, and we, we tried a combination of uh, camshafts to help us reach our target RPM. We started with a set of BC, I, I believe, two 2.2 two cams, and they were falling off incredibly fast after 800. Then we switched to RR3s from four piston, and the, the power carries to 8,800, and then it gently falls off. So we, we've taken it multiple times to 10,000, but we only need to be there if it's not worth it to shift gears. The acceleration is insane. It's a Ford Falcon radiator from Summit that was modified to fit the chassis. Ford Falcon? Yeah, it's a Ford Falcon <laughs> radiator. It was the largest core, it's a triple pass, which gives us triple the cooling capacity and you know two and a half inch thickness on the core just for capacity. We're running a Chevy Blazer alternator. Wow. This is a Dodge Charger idler pulley, a one-off CNC bracket to hold the alternator. 
and it's a Mazda Speed 3 idler pulley that was holding the belt in place. The alternator failure at Road Atlanta wasn't the first time it's happened. We, we had a different bracket previously, then we had the custom bracket made, and then we found out after Road Atlanta it wasn't charging past 5,500 RPMs. So at Road Atlanta, to be able to make Global Time Attack, we actually put a diesel truck battery into the trunk, mm -hmm. and we are running two flyers off of the diesel truck battery. As the amperage gets drawn and the voltage starts to die, the Fuel Lab brushless pump that's over here will run out of jam, and it'll turn off. Oh. So it's very specific. Below 10.8, like 10.8 volts, it won't run. And it's the same with our water pump. So we have to be very mindful. Uh, on on the, the warm-up laps, I'm actually manually shifting the sequential with my hand. It's, it's paddle shifted. CarTech makes this like really sick uh, wireless paddle setup with infrared, and I didn't want to use the air. I would watch the voltage fluctuate every time I'd pull on the paddle and request for the shifter to move. So at Road Atlanta, I was slowly shifting the trans by hand until the flyer. So it's similar here. Is there a reason why it's not charging past a certain? We, we've ran a Power Master alternator, a Track Tough alternator. So uh, MME is who has adapted the Quave sequential transmission to be able to be used behind a K-Series. They actually have an output shaft grooved pulley to run the alternator off the back of the trans. So that's what we're doing after this. God. We're trying we're trying to make Laguna Seca grid life, but tickets are so sparse. You know, I, I would love to run the car there. I think it would be fantastic for, for me, for my guys, just, just to visit such a world-renowned yeah. track. Understood. Yeah, so, I, I, I mean, that's, it's, it's so crazy when you're getting to this point. It's like the problems that you would have never imagined, yeah. you know, that you would run into, that you have to solve. And yeah. I think that's really interesting. Yeah. Huh. Okay. So this actually did start life as a street car, or was it oh, always yeah. a race car? Oh, yeah. It, it's still a clean title, VIN, there's a tag. So we'll, we're thinking about going to Miata's at the Gap in a couple months, and we'll, we'll do a couple laps around, uh, around Tale of the Dragon in it. But it, it has no purpose being on the street. With, with the, its full flat floor underbody, I always worry about the location of the air jacks because when they retract, they're still only about a half inch to an inch above the flat floor. Oh, it does have air jacks, okay. Wow. Huh. So then what's going on? What's this? So, uh, what's happening here? Titanium exhaust was plumbed through the cabin. Uh huh. We had a failure on the clamp. And as the EGT started to climb, the titanium becomes malleable, and it slowly, every time the motor would rock, rocked into the chassis. And uh, our last flyer that we did at 201, the cabin was full of exhaust gas. I was holding my breath coming down the front straight until I could get off the gas and finally breathe. On my cool down lap, I put my hand out of the window to try to redirect some fresh air into the cabin. It's so difficult because the, the quarter windows we extended with the lip, nothing comes inside. So I'm, I'm dying in there, my eyes are tearing, and I don't know if it's emotional you know, fatigue because I can't breathe or I, my eyes are tearing because there's exhaust gas. So then, what happened? There was there a fire or something? Uh, or? That's just the exhaust gas burning the chassis. Oh. Yeah, she she never ignited, but the exhaust tip, which you can kind of see in here, right. that's the old exhaust tip, was out here. Okay. So then, what did you have to do to fix it? Um, I deleted the wideband oxygen sensor. Right. We ad-libbed the hood here. You can see there's a panel on the other side. The boys signed it and we put a date for VIR Hyperfest on it. Yeah. And then so it just shoots out here now. Yeah. More downforce. Yeah, yeah, forced, <laughs> forced downforce. <laughs> wow. Uh, high, high boost is about 39 pounds. We, we've been running the weekend at about 32, 33. So does this sit further back then? It does actually. Like, did you have to move the firewall? What did nope. you have to do? Uh, so V8 Roadsters is who makes the subframe, but it was a naked subframe that we made motor mounts for. Uh, a typical K Miata engine sits over and two inches forward. And so we stood it up 
We made our own oil pan for the dry sump system from Daly's Engineering that's over here. So there's a Daly's dry sump system here. We run a Peterson dry sump tank in the passenger seat. Huh. The biggest problem was the water pump and the alternator did live here. Mm. They don't anymore. The water pump is down in here. That's a CWA 400 from Peerberg. It's an insane water pump. It can move 400 liters per hour. But then you had an issue. But we did have an issue. So then why is it all apart right now? So because the uh, vibration and oscillation of this water neck at high RPM, and the fact that when we cap it, we have to torque it, I'm, I'm sure it caused a hairline fracture that we didn't see. Oh, and, and then it, it, it leaked out of here? That's right, so it, it leaked out, and on our last flyer, uh, at turn 14, we actually hit coolant temp protection, and it limits throttle to 4,500 RPMs. So from turn 14 all the way down to hog pen, I had nothing. And then it lit back up because water finally started circulating again, and then it dropped to 205, and I did a flyer down the front straight, and we hit a 201. So I do believe the car will hit, I, I would like for, if, if this holds together, I'd like for it to hit a 157, 156 today. We, I've never been here before. This is so, your first time. First time, for, well, I've only done five laps because I only have a battery. So I can't learn the track. I've gotta go out, do a lap, come in, charge the battery. So we did a 211, a 205, a 203, and a 201. And I missed this morning's session by about 60 seconds. I pulled up to the back as the last car went, and they told me I couldn't go out because I missed it, which is fine. I completely understand. So then, what was your mile an hour? Uh, we, hit, we hit 169.7 coming down the back straight, and I still lifted, I, I think I'll do 175. But I have to go home to my family. So the braking zone at 175 is substantially longer than the braking zone that exists at 170. This would do 200 if you let it. For sure. At, at our local racetrack, we've hit 178, and I have video that the speedometer does not stop climbing, which is crazy to me because I have a handful of buddies that have R8 twin turbos that go out to our local racetrack, and they're hitting 183. So it, it is, it's a force to be reckoned with. It's terrifying to drive. The wheelbase makes it as such. So the, this, this is all the body panels? Yeah. Yeah, so we use uh, Alumilite for the splitter. We're actually, we just got into the carbon fiber stuff, so uh, next time we're here next year, this, the, all the body panels will be carbon. I'll make molds off of our existing components. I'm trying to shave about 150 pounds off of the car. How much does it weigh now? It weighs 2430 with a full tank. Uh, we run, it doesn't, it doesn't really have a fuel gauge, so we always run it full tank. If we get really serious, we'll start, we'll start to measure fuel. What, what kind of fuel does it run? Oh, over the counter, E85. Uh, we, you know, we, we kind of toyed with running canned E85, but it's really restrictive in the fact that I can't buy it everywhere. And I, I, don't, I don't like that. I, I like to be able to get it at the pump, run race car stuff at the pump. It, it blows my mind that we can do that, but, but it's fantastic. Everything is just so insane on this. Look look at all of this. You could see the body where the fender used to be. Yeah. All of that is cut out. Like, what's the idea with this? This is just to... Uh, yeah, so what we did, I, we rounded this area, which used to come, the pinch weld was here. So we rounded this area, one, to encase the, um, the air jack, two, to vent the high pressure that's in the wheel well. I also wanted it to be a smooth transition as this used to be about three inches wide and it was gonna form a catch for the air. So we're just kind of streamlining the air, leaving the front wheel wells to get a little more downforce on the nose. And then with this wide body setup, yep. uh, how wide of a tire are you running here? Uh, it's 295 square. Wow. So it's a 15, 15 by 11 wheel, uh, 295 square tire. So uh, we don't run a rear bumper. We don't run a rear bumper at all. If that is a serious, that is a serious splitter. So then it's still Cadillac rear end? It is, so the Cadillac rear end is, has actually stayed together for us. The OEM subframe did not. At 800 and change, we actually tore the subframe in half 
which was terrifying. The, the subframe tear happened, and then the pinion ang angle changed on the diff, and then it sheared the drive shaft at uh, uh, NCM. We went to National Corvette Museum uh, Ultimate Track Car Challenge with Grassroots, and I was going down the front straight, and going 140, and all of a sudden the drive shaft started hitting the trans tunnel. Wow. So then this is not active anymore. Yeah, so this, the, the Are you gonna itself, route it through here again, or what uh, do you think? Potentially, potentially. A lot of sanctioning bodies won't let me run it through the hood. So the plan will be to, to reinforce it and have it better with a handful of flex bellows through, through the box to give it free range of movement. The wiring harness has been repurposed about 50 times for 50 iterations of different concoctions we were trying to do. We used to run anti-lag and nitrous in the car when it was BP to try to make up for the fact that it was such an archaic cylinder head design. Um, we just converted to manual brakes. We just added the MK60 ABS. So I, I need to prove that everything works before I build uh, the nicest mil spec harness that we can. Right. right, this is just still in development right 100%. now. 100%. And there are a handful of things that I, I don't believe in. So the, the lithium battery that's down there, mm -hmm. I, I would love to have, but without the alternator doing its thing, the battery's worthless. Right. You know, uh, I'm considering moving the oil tank back to the trunk. Last year it was in the trunk. Moving it up here, it had, I think there's two and a half gallons in the oil tank. Mm -hmm. I'd like to put the weight back in the rear. We, so we run twin fire suppression bottles. Um, they're on the floor right there. One is for just the engine bay because if I'm going 170, 180 miles an hour, I really, really don't want to spray fire suppression in my face mm. in the event that something ignites under the hood. Right. Where everything is running so hot that I need to be able to cover my bases. Oh, yeah. The uh, other bottle is for the entire chassis. It runs in the trans tunnel, in the engine bay, and on the fuel systems. So we're running a, uh, it's, an, it's the newest AIM dash. It's an MXT 1.3. So the AIM it's dash is, is really cool. It, it's uh, so big. Yeah, at, at 10 inches, it's fantastic. It gives you all the data you need and it's fully expandable to any set of parameters, any set of sensors that you can buy because it's infinitely adjustable with CAN. This has a lap timer on it, but I love that the Garmin is green or red Yeah. because when the Garmin turns green or red, I, I know instantly whether I'm doing well or not. Right. The, yeah, there's just so much going on. It's. Oh, for sure. This is legitimately a home-built race car through and through. <laughs> wow. Huh. Yeah, you have the AIM camera system in the back. Yeah. Huh. That is crazy. What a car. I, I can't believe you drive this thing the way you do. Like you push this thing. Yeah. It is, you're, you're just so on the edge of what this chassis was ever meant to oh, do. It should, like it's beyond. <laughs> it should not do what we're doing. Yeah. It shouldn't. Um, it, we, we, have, we have a handful of ideas of maybe going to the salt flats, taking the wing off, putting a fast back on and adding a little bit of rear downforce to see what she'll do wide open. I, I think she'll do 220 miles an hour but that would require a tire that I would be comfortable with doing that on. The, these tires are rated for 167, I believe, from Hoosier. So I, I'm sure they have a margin of error, and, and that's why I'm comfortable going to 178. But the RPM that the tire has to spin being a 15 inch tire, uh, I, don't, I, I don't like thinking about it because of the amount of heat that climbs in the tire as we go faster and faster and faster. Our biggest limitation, honestly, is braking. You have to fit a, a brake system that'll pull down that speed from from one, 170 here. Up this next session will probably be 175. The biggest problem is the fulcrum point away from the center of the hub. You can't squeeze anything being so close to it. Mm -hmm. So the farther are you away, the, the more efficient the braking zone is. So then, uh, and then do, does this have traction control? No. No. Uh, we, we ran out of time. So uh, eventually I will. It, it is terrifying and you know, thanks for offering for me to drive it, but I'm, I'm okay. I'm good. <laughs> like, this scares me. This, this is a serious build, like no doubt about it. I cannot believe 
So then what about this ducting here? Is this all for, this is just for the brakes or how does yeah, this so work? We were, I, we were under the belief that this was going to help us with our alternator issue. We thought because it was under the, the turbo manifold that the alternator was cooking and uh, data shows that that actually wasn't an issue. It was preemptive maintenance and it, it didn't pan out to, to really do anything. The other ducting is for the brakes. By increasing the frontal surface area on the bumper, we pick up a little more downforce, a little less drag, and uh, I can tape off the inside of the, the duct on cold days to limit the flow away from the cooling system. We don't ever have problems with cooling, even, even at 800. Even with that small of an with opening? With that small of an opening. We, if, you, if you look at what was presented, so a company actually sells this this air dam, we added this, and we it was this big, and we put this piece in and shrunk the frontal surface area to that, and we haven't had a single cooling issue unless something breaks. Wow. So then you have to add all this stuff back. Yes. To yep. get it all working, and hopefully the hopefully epoxy it holds. holds. Yeah, we're the heat gun is on it. Is that what's going That's on right that, now? Yeah, so that heat gun is live right now. This is, this oh, should geez. be pretty warm. Yeah, it's, it's warm to the touch. It says one hour cure with heat. That's gonna give us roughly 15 minutes to get the bumper, the splitter, the intercooler pipe on and put coolant in it. Wow, so, well, good luck. I hope yeah, you get that 157, is that what you're I going for? So. I, hope I hope so. We'll be out there checking yeah. for you. This is heavy. Yeah. I found something of yours. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect. So what, what happened? Uh, so we started our flyer. We were coming around uh, hog pen, got on the gas, shifted uh, into fourth. And as soon as the power came on, the drive shaft exploded. It started bouncing around in the tunnel. It's not the first time. So we, uh, we've experienced it in the past. It's just, it's a lot of power. Even though it's a light chassis, it's a lot of power. And uh, we're, we're running a three-inch steel drive shaft, and it's called a 1310 U-joint. It's not a it's not a drag racing U-joint. So the U-joint I need is a 1350, and we we will be upgrading to that. Um, you, before we started rolling, you were talking about how you're literally on the edge of everything. Oh you're, yeah, you're just yeah. pushing it. Yeah, there's the, just nothing left. No, the the axles are rated for 450 horsepower. The the stock stock rotors in the rear because there's not really anything bigger. So it's a sport rotor in the rear with a normal pad. Up front, we're running the largest diameter rotor that I can fit under the car that, that we can easily access. Um, but we're to the point where every, everything's gotta be custom or we have to go to like a 17 inch wheel and tire package to shove a bigger rotor and more clamping force on it. This, I believe we can get this sorted. It's just very annoying because we just fixed this. Uh. The, let's see, Thursday, not this Thursday, last Thursday before Road Atlanta, we we strapped down the car Thursday at 2 p.m. heading to Road Atlanta, strapped the car down on the dyno, we we're gentle through the gears. There's a fracture point in these. It's right here, you see how it's cast? Yeah. And then they machine it, right here it fractures. Damn. So we got rid of these, we don't, we don't use this anymore. Uh, now we, we use uh, some off-the-shelf parts that are actually supposed to be worth a dang. And this is where we are. But the parts we're using are only rated for 600 horsepower. So uh, I can't be upset about it. I knew exactly what it was. I'm more disappointed that we came all the way here to do five laps, you know? And that, I mean, that's the nature of time attack. You're gonna run on the ragged edge of whatever you're doing. And we're doing that in a Miata. I, I enjoy it. I enjoy it because if you show up and you are in a vet, a Lambo, a Ferrari, and you're fast, you should be. You should be fast. Yeah. If you show up in um, a roadster, a grocery getter, a, a cheap top-down car, and you compete with them, man. This is going to be a really dumb question, but sure. why why can't you just turn it down to 500 horsepower for no a couple way. laps? No way. I mean, you would probably hit that 157 Oh, for sure, mark. for sure. But I have to learn the braking zones 
for the fast lap. So I, ha I have to get to pace so I can see where the braking zones are because I'm, I'm limited. Everything's limited. So if I'm, if I'm gonna go out at 500 and then I turn it up to 900, well, I'm, I'm having to relearn the entire curve again and I, I didn't do anything. All I did was maybe learn the track layout and I can, I can do that on a set of Corsa, but the undulations in the track, yes, I agree with you. Maybe turn it down to 500, get a couple laps. But from the perspective of, hey, how hard can I come out of the corner? How much power will the tire take putting it down? And how early do I have to brake? Those I can't, I can't re-simulate unless I go to that power number, you know? So I was, I was ready. It wasn't ready. She's not ready. But hey, that's- What's crazy is the quick uh, epoxy that you did yeah. held. It did hold. It did hold. <laughs> cool and temps were like a, a paltry 170. Yeah. It was perfect. And, uh, but it's the nature of it. I, I, I'm not disappointed so much because I know that we're on the limit. It would be something else. If I had, if I had the right drive shaft or if the 1,000 horsepower rated transmission exploded, I'd be real disappointed because it's supposed to take that. But when I know that I'm at the limit of this, if, if I would have snapped an axle, they're 450 horsepower rated axles. So I just have to either lower my expectation or raise the quality of product slowly. You know, if, if Drive Shaft Shop will make me an axle that'll hold a thousand, that'll fit in here. I've got a, a winner's quick change sitting at the shop that I'm, I'm considering putting in, but then it's all, everything becomes custom again. And I already can't get off the shelf parts for the thing. So I'm always having to beg and plead right before a race event because having a shop, at the end of the day, you have to put the customer first and then right before an event, you start throwing the car together. Thanks. Thanks for showing us this car. I'm just, yeah. I'm still glad to have seen it. Bum that you couldn't put down your flyer, but uh, hopefully we'll see you at another event soon. Oh, of course, dude. We'll be there.